He may have been the most violent basketball player in history. He came to practices with a gun in his gym bag and a knife hidden in his socks. He punched out opposing players and teammates alike. He tore up the ABA but languished in the NBA and his sudden disappearance led to the most outlandish of rumors. Some believe he became a soldier of fortune in Africa, while others believe he was killed by dictator Idi Amin. Most think he's dead, but some think he's alive, living under an assumed name. And everyone wonders what really happened to... John Brisker grew up in the city of Hamtramck, a city inside Detroit with his mother, brother, and two sisters. His mother suffered a stroke when he was young, and half her body remained paralyzed. The government wanted to take us kids away from her, Brisker said, but she went to work and raised us. Brisker himself worked eight hours a day from the age of 11, catching a pneumonia in a car wash before working as a janitor until he was 18 years old. I feel like I missed part of my childhood, Brisker said. I lied about my age, but I had to keep switching jobs because they'd find out. They tried to take us away from my mother one time, but she got out of the hospital and she struggled. I look at her now and think how easy it would have been for her to just quit. Give up. Brisker consoled himself in music, playing the trumpet in the fourth grade before switching to the tuba in the eighth grade. He experienced racial harmony at Hamtramck High School, having friends of all ethnicities as he became one of the top high school players in the state in 1965. The six foot five, 200 pounder averaged 24 points and 20 rebounds per game while playing alongside future NBA star Rudy Tomjanovich. Brisker wanted to go into a Big Ten school, but settled for Toledo. Toledo made me the best offer. They gave me a car, an apartment, and wardrobe, Brisker said. Man, I asked, where do I sign? I didn't care what school it was, but when I got there, I saw people against me because of my color. I hadn't experienced prejudice before, and I started asking questions. I didn't get any answers. I changed then. I got hostile. I wanted to know why I couldn't live in this world too. I'm still asking. He also started as a wide receiver on the football team. He came into his own as a junior, scoring 15 points a game, but by the fall of 1968, his troubles began. He was suspended for one game after he missed a practice session, and the school declared him academically ineligible. Brisker then flunked out, never returning to Toledo. Entering the professional ranks, he was wanted by both basketball leagues and the NFL, as the Dallas Cowboys and San Diego Chargers expressed an interest in him as a receiver. Brisker was drafted by the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA and the Pittsburgh Pipers of the ABA. After bidding and negotiations, Brisker ended up with Pittsburgh. He was all-league in two of his three seasons in the ABA, scoring 53 points in one game and averaging 29 points per game in his second year. Despite his jaw-dropping numbers, Brisker had acquired a bad reputation, that of a man who was not only a malcontent, but capable of physical violence at the drop of a hat. The first time I played a game against Brisker, Billy Knight said, he just turned toward me and busted me in my mouth. I didn't do anything. He just scared me. Charlie Williams echoed Knight's feelings, saying that if you said something wrong to Brisker, or if he thought you said something wrong to him, he would reach into his bag, take out a gun, and shoot you. Opposing players called him a monster, and his teammates complained that he carried a gun. Pittsburgh's coach, Jack McMahon, couldn't control him. Players warned him numerous times when Brisker was in one of his moods, telling the coach, John's in his Dracula bag. On one occasion, Brisker was disruptive throughout an entire practice. An angry McMahon told him to leave and Brisker stormed off the gym floor. But moments later, he returned, waving a gun. Practice is over, McMahon said. Another incident saw Brisker get ejected after he punched an opposing player. The referee threw him out of the game, but Brisker told coach McMahon that he was going to, quote, get my money's worth. Brisker pretended he was walking back to the locker room but when the player stepped to the free throw line, Brisker sprinted back onto the floor, punching the player from behind. In 1971, Brisker was arrested after he refused to get out of a taxi that was reserved for someone else. Four police officers arrived on scene to remove him from the cab. Two of the officers went to the hospital after brawling with Brisker. Despite the threats and acts of violence, Brisker demanded higher pay from the Pittsburgh Condors. 
oddly enough, there were teammates who supported him. Brisk saved me a lot of headaches and bloody noses, teammate Tom Burleson said. Every time I'd get in trouble, he'd come to my rescue. I could tell he was coming because people would start backpedaling and you could see their eyes getting big as half dollars. Some teammates felt that Brisker's anger and mental health issues weren't something that teams were equipped to deal with. By the time old teammate Rudy Tomjanovich visited Brisker in 1971, he saw a completely different person than the one he hung out with in high school years earlier. He was wearing a dashiki, Tomjanovich said, and talking about going to Africa. Africa had become an obsession for Brisker as did the black power movement of the time period. In 1972, the Pittsburgh Condors replaced Jack McMahon with Mark Binstein, who considered Brisker to be the best player in the ABA. I put John in a category with Jerry West and Oscar Robertson, Binstein said after witnessing Brisker score 44 points. He's not a Jabbar or a Wilt, but Brisker is the most exciting player in our league. In 1972, Brisker wanted the big money, and the Seattle Supersonics of the NBA obliged signing the troubled star to a six-year, $1 million contract, even accepting a fine from the league in the process as the 76ers still owned Brisker's NBA rights. During the 1972-73 season, Brisker scored 30 points on four occasions, but averaged only 13 points a game. And in joining the NBA, Brisker's anger issues only intensified as he punched out rookie Joby Wright during a practice, knocking out four of Wright's teeth. Seattle's coach Tom Nasalki didn't care for the former ABA star. I think John had a lot of mean bones, Nasalki said. Sometimes he could be friendly, nice to you, like that. And other times he could be very hostile looking. He had a mean streak. Nasalki noted that Brisker had habitually come into practice with a knife hidden in his sock in case a teammate or a coach angered him. The Supersonics were struggling and had low morale. They had won only 13 of 45 games under Nasalki. There was a rumor that the Sonic players deliberately lost a game in order to get Nasalki fired. A fixed game. I played exactly six minutes of that game, Brisker said, but I was being accused along with everyone else. The following year, the Sonics hired NBA legend Bill Russell as their coach. Changes were made and Brisker realized that he had to lose his reputation as a troublemaker. I gotta grow up, I know that now, Brisker said. Attitude is very important to me. I'm going to turn my whole life around. I've been carrying a big chip. Felt it was me against the world. I got a bad rep, but I'm going to live it down. Russell moved Brisker from forward to guard. In the new position, Brisker scored 47 points and 15 rebounds during his second game. But Russell, like Nasalki, didn't care for Brisker. He wanted team basketball with an emphasis on defense. Russell also didn't like getting calls from police regarding Brisker's latest brushes with the law. Furthermore, Brisker had alienated his teammates after he punched Joby Wright during a practice, and the incident never left their minds. John was upset with the whole scene in Seattle, his brother Ralph said. He was dealing with different type people. He became more cynical and distant. On January 31, 1975, Brisker scored 28 points as he rallied the team from a fourth-quarter deficit against Portland. Despite the victory, Russell once again got on Brisker's case, and the volatile player glared at the coach. I thought he was going to kill him, Slickwatt said. That Brisker, you could see water in his eyes, intimidation, that Brisker was ready to attack. Slick Watts himself had been beaten up by Brisker. I blocked his shot one day and his response was to knock the hell out of me, Watts said. Slap me like a baby. And I took off. I didn't mess with John. Coach Russell then limited Brisker's minutes with every outing. They've done everything possible to demean me, Brisker said. The former ABA star was then demoted to the Eastern Basketball League, then the equivalent of the minor leagues of the NBA, where he was to play for the Hamilton Pat Pavers. Russell said that I had to go down and work on my defense, Brisker said. With that, he was traded to the first-year Cherry Hill franchise. Brisker didn't pout while playing in the EBA. He scored 50 points in one game and bided his time before Seattle brought him back for the 1974-75 season. But Coach Russell kept him on the bench, limiting him to only 13 minutes a game despite his hefty salary. The Sonics tried to trade him but found no takers. Brisker had purchased a new home in Redmond, Washington and a Mercedes-Benz. He decorated his house with African antiques. He then purchased a restaurant and hired his brother Ralph to manage it. With no takers for Brisker's services, the Sonics cut him 
Brisker never made it back into the NBA, instead making several trips to Africa and reportedly purchasing land in Nigeria. Domestic problems followed as his wife Michelle filed for divorce in 1977. She stated that Brisker physically abused her and left her deaf in her left ear. He bounced me around the wall and threw me on the bed, Michelle said. He smothered me until I couldn't breathe. In March of 1978, Brisker allegedly traveled to Africa to launch an import-export business. On April 11th, his girlfriend stated that Brisker called her from Kampala, Uganda, stating that he would send for her soon. No one has heard from Brisker since. His brother Ralph conceded that Brisker had a lot of problems and that he may have gone into hiding to get away from creditors. The last time Ralph saw him was on Christmas of 1976 in Detroit. He seemed pretty jovial, Ralph said. He wasn't too upset, he was just concerned about his future. Different rumors spread over the years of what happened to him. He went to Uganda, former teammate Tom Burleson said, and it was as a mercenary and he was fighting over there. His wife went with him and he was captured by Idi Amin's men, and Idi Amin had him prepared and they served him in his wife, banquet style. Slick Watts stated that Brisker was sitting at a table with one of the kings in Uganda and they had an argument. In that country, Watts said, you don't dishonor the king. And Brisker had one of those grr moments and they said the guy had his gun covered up like a turkey was in it. He moved it and pew, shot him. That's the legend anyway. Rudy Tomjanovic said that Brisker went to Uganda and was a bodyguard for dictator Idi Amin who was a big basketball fan. Another rumor is that Brisker died in Jonestown, Guyana in November of 1979. The State Department could not confirm that Brisker went to Africa at all. The former basketball star was declared legally dead in May of 1985 and his estate was settled. Don Fair, a Seattle reporter, said the stories just get better as you go along. No one knows exactly what happened to John Brisker. <laughs>